Good morning. I'm still in the process of waking up, so got my latte here. We are back at Revelation 17, and I think that you'll find this morning in particular, with the help of Herman Hoxema, Behold He Cometh, uh, Reform Free Publishing, then, an excellent book to get, hold, to get a hold of. Uh, I think you'll find that with his help here, um, <clears throat> the identity and de historical development of the both past, present, and future of the, the beast and the woman on the beast uh, and all these uh, <clears throat> seven heads and ten horns and all of this kind of a thing gets will get to be really clear for us. So um, let's pray and we'll start. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this portion of scripture. Thank you for revealing Christ as he uh, reigns supreme as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, revealing him to us, <clears throat> showing us your plan of redemption that is even now working itself out, always has been, always will be, until a perfect culmination when Christ comes again. We thank you that we can have this certain confidence that as we see this world in chaos, that it really <clears throat> isn't chaos, that in fact you are working out your perfect plan of redemption of your people and of a fallen world and doing so in your son. And so we pray that you would, uh, well, we, so we thank you for this this morning and pray that you would teach us Give us clarity of mind and understanding. Increase our faith and our love for you. And we, we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so here we are, the woman on the beast. And in particular, we want to look at the beast uh, itself. We've seen that the, the woman on the beast is specifically the, the, counterfeit, the counterfeit church. And uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, review just a little bit here. Uh, verse 17. Uh, verse 17. Chapter 17, verse 7. But the angel said to me, John says, Why do you marvel? You know, he's seen the woman on the beast. I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. <clears throat> and we're particularly going to be looking this morning at this the beast with seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other is not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, <clears throat> but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings, who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. The angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast, will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings 
of the earth. All right, well, we'll get especially, let's see, we're going to get today down to uh, <clears throat> uh, about verse 12 right in there and plan next time to look at this matter of when these kings, this beast rebels against the woman and, uh, and destroy her and so forth according to God's purpose. But we'll get to that next time. Let's uh, go back then here <clears throat> to verse 7. I will tell you the mystery, the angel says to John, of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. All right, just a little bit of review from last time. Herman Hoxima here. The same beast shall again appear in the future. Again, the nations of the earth shall unite. They shall be of one mind, shall give their power to the beast. And by a great league or confederation, shall succeed in establishing a universal world power having sway over all things. And, and that statement, um, Hoxima is going to develop for us here. So don't panic. That's just kind of an introduction to what we're going to be um, learning. In the second place, as Hoxima says, we read this last time, we must pay attention to the seven heads, indicating seven different manifestations of the, this world power in history. As we've remarked before, the picture of the beast in our text here places before us, now here, here it goes now, places before us the historic development of the world power as well as its final formation, and it's symbolized in the heads, all right? So the angel tells about these heads, that one is, five have fallen, and that one is not, evidently pointing to some kind of secession of kingdoms. The ten horns evidently indicate a number of world powers, maybe more minor world powers, existing all at the same time, but there is a succession, uh, past, present, and future, in the number of heads. Okay, that's just kind of a generalized introduction here now. So now we need to look at the interpretation, he says, of these, uh, seven, of these seven heads. I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Um, these, we are told, are seven mountains, verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is, uh, is seated. Now, in the Bible, and it's very plain because it, it happens so much, so often, especially in the Old Testament, but mountains are, represent kingdoms, all right? Mountains, a mountain represents a kingdom and, it, and its corresponding uh, king. So now, um, some people take, for instance, and there may some, be some nuance of this here, that um, the seven heads represent Rome of John's day, all right? That the, uh, why is that? Because Rome was known in history as the city of seven hills. No, not seven mountains, seven hills. And apparently it did have seven rolling hills around there. It must still be there uh, today. And so, there, you know, there would be some temptation to say, well, uh, all right, what this image, these seven heads that are seven mountains represents is the Rome of John's day, all right? But as Hoxima shows here, that doesn't fully explain things uh, here in this, in this revelation. Um, <clears throat> let's see now. Surely, he says, the hills of Rome <clears throat> are not at the same time, the kings of Rome. See, so, so we're, we are seeing here, set verse 10, they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, verse 10. One is, the other is not yet come. And that, that doesn't fit uh, when you try to apply the seven heads to, or seven mountains to just the Rome 
of, uh, of John's day. As we'll see now, the Rome of John's day was, and maybe we should put it this way, one of these heads, all right, was one of these heads. So <clears throat> we see that there's some kind of a succession here in verse 10. There's seven kings, five of whom have fallen. <clears throat> all right, by the time of John's day, when he's seeing these visions, five of these kings, these mountains, had already been and they'd fallen, all right? One is, in John's day, one of those heads, one of those <clears throat> seven kings, uh, is, <laughs> was in existence in John's day. There's another one, the seventh, <clears throat> what has what, that hasn't yet come uh, in uh, in John's day, and as we'll see, not even in our day, has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. And then he in verse eleven it talks about an eighth one, an eighth uh, head or something, but it belongs to the seven. That somehow, somehow it. And the previous seven kings, uh, seven heads are uh, all wrapped up together so that he can even say, well, there's going to be this eighth one king that comes, but somehow he, it um, can, consists of the seven, all right? So that sounds confusing, but it, as it turns out, it isn't, and you're going to see that in a minute here. So... All right, as I said, as Hoxima was saying, mountains in Scripture represent strong and conspicuous kingdoms. Just as a mountain, he says, just as a mountain stands for a conspicuous elevation of the earth's surface, elevating itself above even the smaller elevations and hills that might appear next to it. <clears throat> and therefore, a mountain in Scripture <clears throat> is symbolic of a mighty empire or kingdom. And as we're going to see, pretty much a worldwide empire. All right? Not just a localized king and his kingdom, but uh, something, something bigger than that. And, and what this vision is showing, what the angel explains to John, is that by John's day... Five such empires, worldwide kingdoms, had already played out. They'd already come, uh, they'd already enjoyed their time in history and were no more. But also in John's day, one was still, one world empire is, and in, in, in that of course then is, is the Roman, the Roman Empire. Empire. So he does give us some examples here. I'll give you the scripture references, and then uh, if you want to, you can look. You can look them up. But uh, in scripture, for example, in Psalm thirty, verse seven, we hear David sing uh, about his kingdom. He says, "Lord, by thy favor you have made my mountain to stand strong." What he means is his kingdom. David's kingdom, all right? In Jeremiah 51, 25, we read that the prophet spells destruction upon the mighty kingdom of Babylon. And the way that he puts it is this way, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain. So the Babylonian empire likened to a, a mountain, specifically a destroying mountain, uh, says the Lord, which destroys the earth. And... Uh, I will make you a burnt mountain, the Lord says to Babylon. And then Daniel 2, verse 35, we read there, this is in Nebuchadnezzar's image of the statue, the stone that's cut loose without hands, it symbolizes the kingdom of God and it develops into a great mountain filling the earth. And so on and on. There's another one in Zechariah 4, verse 7, uh, who are you, O great mountain? As uh, talked about the world powers that were opposing the rebuilding of, of, the, of the temple and so forth. And therefore, as Hoxima says, it's not strange then for us to meet with here in Revelation 
the figure of a mountain indicating a king and a kingdom. And so that's, what the, that's what's going on here in verse 9. Uh, well, I can back up verse 7. Uh, let's see, where does it introduce the mountain first? 9, I guess. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings. In other words, these seven heads represent seven, not just kings, but seven world empires. And what John is told, as we've seen here, by the, the time of John, when John is seeing this, five of whom have fallen. Five of those world empires had already uh, come to power, enjoyed their heyday, and were no more. All right, they, they, were, they were played out. Another one of the seven hasn't come yet, hasn't come in John's day yet, and when he comes, he must remain only a little while, and then there's going to be some kind, some kind of an eighth mountain, some kind of an eighth king or head, that its constituency, it consists of uh, elements, aspects somehow, of all of the seven previous empires, and it's headed its heads for uh, destruction. Now, check this out. All right. In this light, it's not difficult to understand the rest of the angel's explanation of the mystery. He says, five are fallen, one is, and one is not yet come. So let's take our starting point at the one that is. All right. So here we are. <clears throat> five of whom have fallen, one is. So Hoxima is going to talk about that, all right? How come that didn't color here? What's going on? Oh, well, it doesn't want to cooperate for me. One is. Ah, you can see it. The curse is right there. All right, one is. Now, what is this, what is this kingdom that exists in John's day? Um, take our starting point then at the one that is we can make no mistake about it it is of course the one that existed at the time of John's exile on the Isle of Patmos namely the mighty Roman Empire and it held its sway over practically the whole world All right, it's a world empire so the king <coughs> the mountain, the kingdom uh, the one of these seven that is in the days of John it was the Roman Empire. And remember now, as we're looking at these seven kings, mountains, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're world empires. This is just not some more localized kingdom. For example, it would be a mistake, and I'll bet you down the line some guy has tried to pull this. Uh, it would be a mistake. So one of these kings has to be uh, the United States, something like that. Well, the United States, at some points, it, uh, has been, in a way still is, although you wonder sometimes, right, a, a world power. But as far as being a world empire that rules, you could say, the known inhabited earth, right, that kind of a thing, like the Roman Empire did, no. We're, when we're trying to identify these seven heads or seven mountains, we're, we're looking for world um, world empires. So, um, <clears throat> at least world empires in respect to um, the world of John's day, for example. You know, it's over in the Mediterranean. It's over in Italy and, and Europe and, and uh, Persia and Egypt. That, that area over there, you, you know, you think about it uh, in in history, uh, in biblical history, you, you don't see, you say, you say, well, where, what was going on in North America at the time, or South America, right? Yeah, Joseph Smith and the Mormons, uh, they claim they have some kind of answer to that. But as far as the biblical revelation goes, um, the empires that Scripture is concerned with don't you that doesn't even those areas don't even come into the picture 
China, those kinds of, you know, it might be, maybe somebody could find some oblique <clears throat> reference to something, but um, what we're talking about here is, for example, the areas of geography of the world that, say, the Roman Empire ruled, that, that kind of a kingdom, all right? That's what we're looking at in trying to identify these, these seven. So, um, it is, of course, that, <clears throat> that head, the one that is, uh, was the Roman Empire. Now, what you want to do then is you want to back up, all right? So let's calculate back from Roman Empire to the five that are fallen, and what do we find? Well, <clears throat> before Rome, the Roman Empire came to power, there was another empire which Rome conquered, and that was, of course, Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, the Greek Empire, the Greek Empire. Um, so you've got, that would be um, <clears throat> uh, number five, okay? So the one that is, in John's day, is Rome. Now five have fallen. So if you want to, so let's say, <clears throat> let's say Rome, let me get my numbering straight here. Rome would be what, number six? One is, the other's not yet come. Number seven hasn't come yet, okay? So one is, so Rome is number six of the seven. So what is number five, the previous world empire? <clears throat> it's Alexander the Great's empire, the Greek and Roman empire. Then we back up, and before that, number four, uh, the fourth head would have been uh, Media Persia, the kingdom, and uh, you remember that, and you see parallels here, by the way, to the secession of kingdoms that were represented by, in Daniel 2, by that vision of, the, of this image, the statue, the head of gold and so on, that, uh, <clears throat> that was shown to Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, the fourth one is Media Persia, and then it was preceded, number three, Three, I get the numbers mixed up here. Um, it was preceded by Babylon. All right, that's Babylon number three. And then um, that was King Nebuchadnezzar in, in the days of Daniel then. All right, that, that was one of these heads, the third one. And before that, this would be number two, the Assyrian Empire uh, under Sennacherib and so forth. The Assyrian Empire is what wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel back in 722 BC. And then before that, what world empire was there? We see this playing out in scripture. Well, it was, it was Egypt. And so as Hoxima uh, sums these up, he says, thus we obtain the following five, all right? Um, here's this beast has seven heads that are seven kingdoms, seven mountains, there's seven kingdoms on which the woman is seated. And somehow, see, this counterfeit Babylon antichrist woman is, is uh, seated on kind of direct, her spirit is involved. All of these, think about it, none of these kingdoms were godly in any way. They all persecuted and opposed the, the, the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So, um, so now, he, so he says here, okay, so here's how it works out. <clears throat> here's the five world empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, or Media Persia, and Greece. And then, of course, Rome in John's day. Hoxima says, all these are mentioned in Scripture. Now, you see, we, you say, well, why? how come the Bible doesn't talk about uh, China or the United States or South America or things like that? Well, you don't find them in Scripture <clears throat> directly at, at all. How come? They don't play into the history, directly into the history of the Messiah, of God. You know, every one of these kingdoms right here, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece, and then Rome, we, they appear in your Bible, in, in, in the history 
of redemption. And what are they doing? They're opposing the kingdom of God. That's what they're doing. Um, the um, North America and whoever was living here then at the time, North America, the, China even, the, these weren't world kingdoms at that time that came into play, all right? So uh, in regard to the development of the kingdom of God in the, uh, in, in the Messiah. <clears throat> so all of these kingdoms were conspicuous in their opposition to the kingdom of Israel, okay? So now, and then you, so you, ha then you have Rome then in his day. So now, then in, in John's day, what about then this one that hasn't come? All right? We've accounted for six of them here. For six of them. These uh, five of whom have fallen, one is. And now, in our day, six have fallen because Rome has fallen. Now think about this. Was Rome replaced by any um, worldwide empire that was like, um, comparable to the Roman Empire or to Babylonian Empire? And the answer is no. Now there have been um, little dictators, you know, the the Hitlers and the others who have come along and, <clears throat> you know, some, some people thought, and with some, some basis, really, if you lived at the time, that uh, Germany, that Hitler's Third Reich Empire was going to be one of these kingdoms, maybe even that seventh head. Now, certainly it was Antichrist and, and so forth, of the spirit of the Antichrist, but it did not succeed like Rome had in conquering, you would say, uh, the world. And so, even in our day, <clears throat> the seventh head, the seventh kingdom, has not <clears throat> yet come, all right? Rome has fallen, but the other has not yet come, we could, the angel could say to John, when we can say the same thing today. The seventh kingdom hasn't come yet. When he does come, he must remain, but only for a little while. Now, I hope that you're beginning to be encouraged by this, all right? Because <clears throat> what, what God is telling us here in his word plainly is he's orchestrating this whole succession of world, of world empires, and there's another one that's going to come. What does that tell us? There's lots of implications here, for one thing. For one thing, <clears throat> this means that the, the world is not going to go up in nuclear flames tomorrow, all right? It's not going to happen. Um, this, this world, this present perishing world is going to go up in flames someday, but that'll be at, at, God, at God's doing. Something has to happen yet. In some ways, I guess you could say, no doubt, the, the mechanism is in place now, working, although uh, <clears throat> its time hasn't come yet. We haven't seen a seventh king, a seventh worldwide empire <clears throat> arise yet, right? And as we'll see, Christ cannot come, cannot return until these things play out, until this seventh king comes down, and even an eighth, all right? There's going to be an eighth kingdom. These are the things to be, <clears throat> then to be watching for. Now, <clears throat> I think in part that some of the... Uh, this, this might be, I'm speculating a little bit here, <clears throat> but this might be where some of the uh, proposal of what's called a secret rapture of the church comes in. Because <clears throat> the Bible does tell us that we don't know the day or hour when Christ is coming again. We don't know. 
But at the same time, you can look at what we're just looking at here, and we can say, he's not going to come today. He's not going to come tomorrow. Um, he, for th this, this seventh king and then an eighth has to come to power first. And so I think probably what happens is, it's kind of a, a dilemma. How can we say that nobody knows his time and that we're to live every day as if Christ could return at any moment, which seems like the Bible teaches that, right? <clears throat> and yet, at the same time, we can say, according to what we're seeing here, is Christ can't come today because the seventh and the eighth haven't come to, to power yet, all right? How can we, and so I think that maybe this might be one reason that people came up with this. There must be two comings, returns of Christ. One of them is to be um, secret. That is to say, not visible as such. What he's going to do is just take every believer out of the world before Antichrist really comes to full power <clears throat> and so forth. He takes his people out of the world. And then after these other events play out, kingdom of the Antichrist comes to full power and so forth. Then Christ comes again visibly. Okay, so you've got, and I think you find that especially in dispensation, what we would call dispensational theology or eschatology. Remember the word eschatology means the study of last things, the study of this kind of stuff, right? Biblical prophecy, um, because eschatos, eschatos is just a, the Greek word for last, okay? So the doctrine of the last things, eschatology. And so <clears throat> you have it there. Uh, we don't hold to that. There's going to be what I think is a correct view of this is Christ is coming one more time. <clears throat> He's coming once visibly. And that's when he raises up his, you know, we who are alive and remain shall not precede those who fall asleep, Paul says. He tells, tells to the the Corinthians and, and so forth. So, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and, and, and so on, that that's coming. But I think you can see that there's really assurance in this because we know for sure, just as God raised up and then took out these five, six actually, counting Rome, uh, world empires before, there's going to be another one. And there isn't. If you think about it right now, there is not a world empire right now. There isn't. Um, what have you got? And some of this, this might play into what we, what we see now, all these nations of the earth. What we might uh, say, how, well, how do they come into this? Well, they might be those ten horns. You know, miscellaneous sub-kingdoms type thing. It's interesting that back in Daniel 2, the ro in that image of the uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, the statue, you know, head of gold, arms and breast of silver, uh, that's Media Persia, the bronze midriff, that's uh, Greece, and get these mixed up, yeah, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and then Rome, the legs, you know, there's a mixture of iron and so forth, but then there's this ten toes thing, well, ten, there, okay. <clears throat> Maybe that's the, what we're seeing right now. We're in the era of the ten. There isn't a, a world empire. There's, there's lots of world sub-kingdoms here, you might say. And with rare exception, they're all of the spirit of the beast. They are all opposed to um, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, you see this then. Where are we right now? <clears throat> we're waiting for the manifestation of a seventh world empire. World empire. And it'll be, it would seem that it's going to be literally a world empire in a, more fully than even the Roman Empire. That in our day and age and technology and everything, you know, it is much more, and transportation, far more conceivable 
that one Caesar, for instance, could rule the entire world, <clears throat> every, every single part of it. And that's the nature of the kingdom of the, uh, of the Antichrist, all right? <clears throat> so, the angel continues here. The seventh is not yet, all right? Verse 10, they are also seven heads. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and we'd say now, six have fallen. Rome's gone. The other, the seventh, has not yet come. When he does come, he must remain only a little while. <clears throat> now, his, his spirit is operative. Satanic spirit, spirit of the Antichrist is operative. But God hasn't permitted him to come to, to power yet. So, uh, Hoxima continues here. The seventh is not yet. So, the angel continues. And when he comes... He must continue a little while. That seventh power has not yet been, all right? Ever since the final downfall of the Roman Empire in the year 476, the history of Europe has been a struggle between the various nations of the continent. True, there have been some powerful empires, but there never has but never has any succeeded in obtaining undisputed control of the universal power of the world. All right? Where are we right now? We're awaiting the manifestation of a seventh world empire. Now, you see, God's hand in, in preventing that from happening until his appointed time. It hasn't happened. But you see attempts. <clears throat> you know, think of it. In, in ways, and we've seen this before, this seventh world kingdom of Antichrist that's going to arise, it's just like the Tower of Babel. It, it's going to be the Tower of Babel revisited, Nimrod appearing. And maybe that has to do with uh, people marveling is what he, he was and then he wasn't, and now here he is again. You see this this world, <clears throat> this world empire. But what what is the spirit of ungodly kings, ungodly nations? It's the spirit of Babel. We're going to build this tower that will reach into the heavens. We you know we will be God. That's what we're going to do. And it's all this effort. Uh, that's what. You know, fight, look at the tyrants and dictators and so forth of all of them. Uh, but none of them have been allowed to succeed. And they won't be until in God's appointed time, the Antichrist is <clears throat> allowed. All right. Now, the ultimate formation of the beast. So what's going to happen when he does come to power? And so Hoxima says, how then shall the final formation of the beast come into actual realization? In order to understand this, we must in the first place understand there, <clears throat> as we've said, there shall still be a seventh powerful kingdom which has not yet been. <clears throat> oh, and I know I was going to say also, you've seen the spirit, the spirit of this Antichrist, this seventh king, operative in many ways in the world. He uses these little kings to oppose the kingdom of God, persecute God's people, try to stamp out the Bible and all of these kinds of things, right? But, and so he's at work. And then you see these efforts of men trying to reestablish Babel, some kind of world kingdom. And so you see it, for example, and... I know there's probably been some crazy theories in, in this respect and so forth, and we don't want to get involved in that. But just about, just think about after World War I, the, the League of Nations that was established. You know, Woodrow Wilson, the president, was pushing that and so on. But then um, ultimately into what we have today, the United Nations. Now, you, you think about that word. Think about those phrases, United Nations. That's kind of scary. Ever since uh, um, Babel, when God confounded the languages of the people, you know, he said, you know, if, if I let them go on the way that they are, 
one language, one people, nothing will be impossible for them. And they'll be able to establish great uh, levels of evil and wickedness. And so he divided them up. And in that sense, you can always say God's will today is not united nations in a sense. It's not this, this, this spirit of, uh, well, let's do away with borders. Let's do away, well, let's have a one world economy. You see, all of this stuff, that's, that's antichrist stuff. And so, someday it's, it, someday it's going to happen, but uh, God holds it down. And we should be thankful that he, that he, <clears throat> that he does so. Um, and so now Hoxima goes on here. <clears throat> a mighty nation is still to appear. It seems the, in an entirely different light. If we take in connection with this picture of the seven heads, the symbolism of the ten horns, we read that they are all of one mind and shall give their power to the beast. Okay, so that's verse 13. Uh, well, let's look at 12. The ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, <clears throat> but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So, so what you have here then, we see that there's somehow or another in this, in this seventh and then developing into an eighth uh, kingdom, kingdom of the Antichrist, um, he's going to amalgamate. He's going he's to merge the kings and the nations of the world into this one. And, and they are of one mind. And that is they, they serve the beast. They have one mission. And what's their mission? They will make war on the lamb. All right? That's what, they're, that's what it gets. What is this all about? Why is the Antichrist going to establish his kingdom? What's his purpose? He wants to make war on Christ. And he's going to do that by making war on Christ, on Christ's people. Um, okay. <clears throat> Hoxima goes on then. Taking these two statements together... Oh, let's see, I didn't finish that. So, if we take in connection with this picture of the seven heads, the symbolism <coughs> of the ten horns, and read that they are all of one mind and shall give their power to the beast, we receive the impression that the future realization of the kingdom of Antichrist is going to be, now listen to this, is going to be by way of confederation rather than by way of conquest. How is this kingdom of Antichrist that consists of all these other kingdoms merges into one? How is, how is he going to come to power? It isn't going to be so much like the way Rome came to power or Alexander the Great or Babylon where they marched out and they conquered this kingdom with military might and they conquered that kingdom. This way, all of a sudden, the kings, these sub-kingdoms are... They are of one mind, one purpose. They all want a war against, against Christ. So they hand over their power and authority uh, voluntarily. They agree, let, yeah, let's, let's do this. And that's what, he, uh, that's what Hoxha means when he, means when he says <clears throat> the realization of the kingdom of Antichrist is going to happen uh, rather by way of confederation Let's get together on this deal here, right? Rather than by way of forced conquest. So taking the, Hoxima goes on here now, taking these two statements together then, it seems that we are justified in drawing the following picture. So he's going to summarize this. The text here speaks of a seventh mighty power which is still in the future. It hadn't received its dominion in John's time. But there can be no question about the fact that it will receive its dominion according to God's will in the fullness of time, all right? For a short while, and there's emphasis on that, a short while, it will show its power as a separate power. It must continue a little while 
in the midst of <clears throat> all the other kingdoms or powers which may exist together with it. He's talking about the seventh kingdom here. But after this, so what he's saying is, <clears throat> on the horizon here is going to be this seventh kingdom <clears throat> that comes to power. I suspect this might be the little horn of, uh, is it Daniel 7 back in the image? Anyway, um, <clears throat> the Antichrist has a seventh kingdom. He, he, he arises and for a short time seems to exist together with the other kingdoms of the world. But after this little while is finished, whatever may be the history of it, the other powers, the kings and so on, indicated by the ten horns, will give their power to the beast together with that seventh head, thus forming the great final confederation or league that will constitute the ultimate form of the anti-Christian world power. And that's this eighth thing that's talking about here. Um, <clears throat> let's see here now. Let me back up here. Where did we see the eighth? Uh, <clears throat> Must have been even earlier, huh? Let's see here. Here you get seven heads, seven mountains. Um, <clears throat> oh, here it is, verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, it's an eighth. So, but it belongs to the seven. Do you see that? Verse 11. It's an eighth, but it belongs to the seventh. In other words, it is a confederacy of, of the seven, these seven world empires. It's like, it's like drawing <clears throat> Egypt and uh, how this goes, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. It's like, it's like drawing them somehow all together. Can you reviving them only in one form? final massive world empire kingdom as you, and, and it's led by this antichrist kingdom that comes on the scene as the seventh head but then all of a sudden they form they, this confederacy into one mighty world eighth kingdom all right and it but the destiny of it isn't somehow glorious it's not like as for the beast that was and is not it is an eighth it belongs to the seven, consists of the seven. And boy, what great things it's going to... But look at how it's summarized in verse 11. It goes to destruction. For all of its pomp, and it's going to just exist for... See verse 12? The ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. They are to receive authority as kings for one hour. The emphasis here is on a short time. A short time, a short while. So... Uh, let's see, what else does Hoxima say here? <clears throat> they shall constitute the ultimate form of the anti-Christian world power. It will be a league formed of the seventh head together with the ten horns. And the ten horns, remember, would be the existing small kingdoms uh, existing at the time. We can understand then the expression apparently so difficult to grasp. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. That seems so difficult to understand. That is, the beast in its entirety, that is, this ultimate eighth antichrist worldwide kingdom, as a confederation of world powers, all of them being of one mind and purpose, all giving their power to the beast, that one great league is that eighth power. And what is it? It's that old kingdom of Nimrod over again in modern form. First, therefore, come the seven great powers, but the seventh culminating in the final manifestation of the anti-Christian world power, which as such shall be the eighth. And it's going to go to destruction. It is this eighth kingdom is the culmination and the consummation of all history. See, see this? That's, that's what it's moving towards right now. God's in perfect control of it. The climax of history of these seven powers 
It is the combination of all that Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and all the powers which have followed have ever stood for and realized. And what is it when it gets right down to it? What were they about? Making war on the Lamb. Making war on the Lamb. To recapitulate then, in brief, there are to be eight world powers in all. Six have already been. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The seventh is not yet, or if it is today, it hasn't become plainly manifest. Okay, Spirit of the Antichrist, John says in 1 John, is operative today. Many Antichrists then have gone out. <clears throat> its existence shall be peculiar in this respect, that it shall aim at the unification and combination of all the powers that exist at this time, at the time when that eighth kingdom comes to power. And this shall lead to the final league of nations to realize the kingdom of the Antichrist. Okay, well, we'll stop right there. But that may, that's pretty clear, isn't it? He does a great job in, in helping us then understand this. And this should be, as I said, it's meant to be a tremendous encouragement <coughs> to, to all Christians, all of God's people, to Christ's church today is that um, um, they will make war on the Lamb and the Lord, the Lamb will conquer them. All right, that, that's it. That's how, that's how it is going to go down. And that's where we're at right now in history, in human history. That's what's going to, the next player on the stage um, arising, some kind of seventh king, seventh mountain who is Antichrist. And then the next thing is to merge the nations together into one final antichrist effort to, uh, to destroy God, if, if they could. But just as it failed at Babel, it will, it will ultimately and final, finally fail then. So we'll stop right there and plan to pick up. The, the next heading Hoxima has here is the certain defeat of this beast. So, Father, we thank you for these encouraging words. We pray that uh, you would enable us to persevere faithfully in this world, knowing that you are in perfect control, that Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that uh, Satan and his minions never make a single move without your decree and your permission Everything they do is uh, used by you to carry out your purposes. And we pray, Father, then that, <clears throat> that we would keep our eyes set upon things above, that, that we would not be discouraged by the chaos and evil that we see in this present world, but that we know that uh, the time is short and that... Uh, um, six of these nations, six of these heads have already arisen and passed in, into history. And so we really do live in the last of the last days. And we look forward to, to these great events that, uh, that will manifest your glory and your hand and end in the return of Christ. And we pray that that would happen soon. It's in his name we pray. Amen.